Greetings in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to the Sunday broadcast of worship of Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. My name is Paul Evans and I am so blessed to be the pastor of such a faithful, loving congregation. Joining me once again this day are our pianist, Sylvia McDonald, and our videographer, Kathy Marquis, and the three of us are so pleased, along with our congregation, to be able to come into your homes or wherever you happen to be viewing the service today. We're very grateful that you've chosen to be a part of our virtual congregation, wherever you are. If you wish to rewatch the service or commit to someone else, be mindful that you can find the, a link on our church's Facebook page, Jefferson Presbyterian Church, or you can go directly to youtube.com and search for Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. Here in our congregation, as we meet together, historically, we, for a long, long time, have always begun our time together with a time of greeting and a time of passing the peace of Christ. We're continuing that tradition even though we have a lack of a physical congregation. So I invite each of you to take a brief moment and turn to those who are about you and to offer the words, the peace of Christ be with you. And as you greet others, they in turn may greet you or you can greet others with the return phrase and also with you. And remember, if you're by yourself, remember those whom you love and would wish to greet, call out their names the Lord our God hears all. And so, family of faith, as we prepare to worship now, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. of faith, let us be called together to worship God. Who will be our people? God's people will be our people. Where will we go? Wherever God leads. What are we willing to leave behind? Everything that hinders our following our Lord Jesus. May our worship today lead us to a place where all of this may be so, let us pray. God of providence, 
You summon us to walk the winding ways and straight paths of this world. You dare to walk with us, O God, despite our desire to follow our own directions, not yours. You're ever willing to make course corrections for us to set us back on the right path. As we gather once again this day, we come with gratitude for the gift of your constant presence, your trustworthy guidance, and your daring risk-taking to journey with us. Attune our hearts and minds to your word that will tell us where we need to go and what we need to do to follow your son. In his name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare now to confess our sins, let us be mindful of the fact that the word confess means literally to say the same thing as. That is, when we confess our sins, we're saying the same thing about our sins as God says about them. We are acknowledging our failings. But let us go before the one who's walked our way and has made a pathway for us back to righteousness through Christ. Let us pray together. God of great mercy, forgive us when we walk away from you and then wonder where you are. Forgive us when we fail to see the signs you place along our paths. Forgive us when we're too distracted to revel in the wonder of your creation. Have mercy on us when we forget who we are and whose we are. Remind us once again that we are not a lost people, but rather we are a found people and that there is no place we can go where you are not. Hear us now, O God, as we offer our own personal prayer of confession. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And so now, let us hear the good news as it comes to us from the Apostle John who wrote in his first epistle. If we say we have fellowship with him while we're walking in darkness, we lie and do not what is true. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. I declare, therefore, on the authority of Jesus Christ, that you and I, we all are forgiven.
Sisters and brothers, let us now go before the Lord for a time of prayer. Let us join our hearts and minds together as one. Most holy God, we come praising you for the love that you've shown, the unique love that comes to us, a love not dependent on our being worthy or in some way of deserving it. We praise you for making your love real to us in Jesus Messiah, who at the cost of his own life became one of us in order to overcome the sin that has separated us. He revealed the true nature of love by coming among us as one of us leaving behind all heavenly splendor to experience the joys and hurts, the highs and lows, the laughter and tears, the hopes and disappointments of human life. Yet he remained obedient and full of love and lived, served, and died for us. Yet death could not claim him, and he was raised from the dead so that we might, with him, have everlasting life. And so we declare, O God, your holiness, majesty and beauty that radiates from all that is around us and we along with all of creation shout that glory power and praise be given to you alone we thank you that you're not only saving us you're saving us for relationship with you and with one another and so we offer our gratitude for the gift of your spirit whose mighty power is able to keep us forever in your love and forever in the love we share with each other we rejoice that we've not been left alone, but are blessed with your presence every moment of every day. We can live in such hope and confidence, knowing that you are the God who is always with us. Thank you for calling us to be your people, your ambassadors in the world. Help us to represent your kingdom well, O oh God, and reflect by our words and deeds the values of your kingdom. As you have reached out to us, help us to reach out to others, regardless of their social position, their skin color or nationality, their political views or their faith background or lack thereof. Continue to teach us to share love that knows no bounds. Be with those, gracious God, who are struggling with losses, the death of loved ones, the demise of work and income, the lack of time with family and friends, the deficit of fellowship caused by little or no corporate worship, the loss of our personal freedoms to do and go as we have always enjoyed doing. Bring healing and wholeness, O God, to all who hurt. Remind us of the living hope we share in Christ and help us not to succumb to despair and sorrow. Bless all those, O God, who are in the healing arts, those who protect us and rescue us, those who teach, those who lead and serve in our various levels of government, those who do the mundane jobs of everyday life that make our lives more comfortable, safe, and enjoyable. Grant all of them strength, wisdom, courage, patience, and knowledge. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, who teaches us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
faith as we prepare to receive our offering this day, let us be mindful of the fact that we give not because God has a need or the church per se has a need. We give first and foremost because God is a giver and we desire to be like God. So with grateful hearts, let us make our offering to him. Let us pray. We may never know, God, precisely where these gifts we offer go or what they may accomplish. We do know, however, that they belong to you and we have the faith that they will be used for your holy purposes. We give them out of gratitude we have for all of you bestowed upon us. May others come to know that gratitude as well. All of those whom these gifts will touch. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And to the times in which we live, as I hope and pray you will see today in the days that come. This morning, our scripture comes from chapter one of Ruth, and I will be using selected scriptures and will weave them into the sermon as I most often do. In preparation for hearing God's word, let us pray together. Gracious God, once again, by your great mercy, 
Give us ears to hear, minds that will understand, and hearts that will joyfully and faithfully follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Amen. The acclaimed novelist Charles Dickens once said that the story of the prodigal son was the greatest short story ever written. But he also went on to say that the story of Ruth was a close second. Indeed, the story of Ruth is a gripping one with some interesting turns and twists. But more importantly, it is such a crucial story because it occurs at a very tenuous time in the life of Israel. In addition, it sets the stage for the coming of a king, a shepherd king by the name of David, and even a future, far more future king, one named Jesus. Our story of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges, that is, after the time of Joshua, but before the beginning of kingship in Israel. The time of judges was a very, very difficult and trying time for the people because leadership was only raised up from time to time by God. There was not one constant figure to stand over them and exercise authority and power. And indeed, there were very scattered people by this time. Our story of Ruth begins, however, with a woman named Naomi, who's beginning a journey homeward to Bethlehem of Judea, a place which she and her husband had left about 10 years ago or so in the midst of great famine in the land. Hearing that there was an abundance of food in the land of Moab, she and her husband, Emiliac, moved there and raised a family. They had two sons, Malon and Kilion, who both married Moabite women, one named Ruth and one named Orpah. Incidentally, you might be interested in knowing that Oprah Winfrey, her original name on her birth certificate is actually Orpah. That was her given name, but somehow uh, letters got switched around and she became Ophrah instead. But her original name comes from this very story. But here's a little bit more of the backstory that's important for us to understand what's going on. Moab is a country lay across the Dead Sea, across from Judah. Today, it is the modern country we know as Jordan. The Moabites descended from Lot, nephew of Abraham, but they were considered a cursed people, these Moabites, for several reasons. Perhaps the most important one was that even though they shared a common ancestry, the Moabites would not allow Moses and the Israelites to pass through their land as they traveled to the land of promise. Consequently, the Israelites and Moabites did not get along and had a lengthy history of hate and even warfare. Though occasionally, from time to time, there would be periods of peaceful coexistence. Although it wasn't contrary to Mosaic law for Naomi and Emiliac's sons to marry Moabite women, it certainly was not encouraged. But in defense of her sons, marriageable Israelite women in Moab would have been few and far between, to say the least. And while we don't know the details, we learn that as the story begins, Naomi's husband and both of her sons have died. We're not told how or when they died, but all three are now deceased, likely somewhat recently. Interestingly, Malon's name means sickly and Kilian's name means failing. So perhaps they had congenital health issues or struggled with poor health all of their lives. When a woman was widowed in those times, it was essential for the family to step up and provide support, especially from the males. But now Naomi has no husband or family, and so she is facing falling right into poverty and destitution. Orpah's and Ruth's families could have perhaps offered to help but they may never have been quite happy about their daughters marrying Israelite men. To put it plainly, 
Naomi was not their responsibility. And for whatever reasons, no one apparently in Moab stepped up to help Naomi. Confronted with a rather bleak future, Naomi decided to return to her homeland of Bethlehem. For she had heard that the famine there had gone away and that there was now plentiful food available. Orpah and Ruth decide to follow Naomi to a new place in hopes of getting a new start. But Naomi is insistent that they return to their families and remain in Moab. She says to them, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Do I have sons still in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even though I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far, far more bitter for me than for you because of the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Orpah finally took Naomi's advice, turned around and went home. Ruth, on the other hand, refused to go back. And so Ruth speaks these words that are often remembered today, and especially at weddings where they're either read or sung. She said to her mother-in-law, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. How could Naomi refuse such powerful words? Words that indeed have been remembered down through history and remain some of the best known and best beloved words of the Old Testament. But there is one word amidst Ruth's words, however, that really stands out, an important word, and it's the word Lord. It's important for us to know that the Moabites did not worship the same God as the Israelites. Rather, they worshiped a God called Chemosh, which further explains why the Israelites and Moabites did not get along. In my recent sermons on the Old Testament names of God, we learned that when we see the name Lord in the Old Testament and find it in all capital letters, it actually means that the word there is Yahweh, God's personal name. When Ruth says to Naomi, may the Lord do thus and so to me, she uses the intimate and personal name of God. That tells us that unlike Orpah, Ruth had become a believer in the God of Naomi, that is Yahweh. As a result, we know that Ruth is not blindly following her mother-in-law to another land purely out of desperation. In fact, Ruth's Prospects for a good life in Bethlehem were not too good to begin with. She comes as a widow, childless, and perhaps infertile. She has no biological family anywhere nearby, no dowry. Should she remarry? Furthermore, her prospects for marriage are slim because she's older and there weren't many eligible men in the small village of Bethlehem. She likely has few, if any, earthly possessions, but she does have one prominent thing that makes all the difference in the world. Ruth has faith. Faith in a God named Yahweh, a God who is, a God who is with us. 
She has enough faith to follow Yahweh into what for her is the unknown. Meanwhile, Naomi, of course, has faith in Yahweh too, but her faith has taken a beating, but she at least has sufficient faith to return home. When the two finally reach Bethlehem, the little town is stirred by their arrival. There are people who remembered Naomi and asked, is this Naomi? Likely both age and distress had taken their toll on this widowed woman. So Naomi replied to them saying, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Interestingly enough, Naomi's name in Hebrew means pleasant or even sweet, but there's no pleasantness nor sweetness in her at the moment. She indeed is filled with bitterness and insists that the people call her Mera, which is the Hebrew word for bitter. What Naomi is experiencing is precisely what we've all experienced at one time or another, grief, profound grief. For all loss is grief, and her losses were great, and so is her grief. Sisters and brothers, it's so obvious that you and I are living today in the midst of a grieving society. We've all experienced losses in some way due to Corona-19, some obviously much greater than others. Some have lost family and loved ones, and many have suffered illnesses. Jobs have been lost and businesses hard hit financially, even closed permanently for some of them. Our children and youth and college young people have had their school years, two of them seriously disrupted. Social, religious and recreational gatherings have been restricted, contributing to the loss of our freedom to gather, to work, to worship, to recreate. In addition to all of this, of course, as we well know, racial tension is very high, as well as economic, political, and military issues. Furthermore, our country is still being victimized by disease, forest fires, hurricanes, and flooding, not to mention looting and burning. I have chosen for these next weeks to explore the Book of Ruth because I believe this book expresses in a very powerful way and addresses in a powerful way what we are experiencing right now. For the book of Ruth is set in the midst of famine, in the midst of loss of life, in the midst of racial tension, and it confronts all of these issues, the issues we face as well. But it also concerns itself with the most crucial issue of all, the issue of faith. Or you see, for Naomi, her faith and hope have succumbed somewhat to the grief and sorrow that has brought her back home. She and her husband left Bethlehem on a full tank, but now she has come back running on empty. I've often wondered how Ruth felt about Naomi describing herself as coming back empty. Ruth is obviously a gracious woman and she will not confront Naomi about this. But the fact is that Naomi does not return to Bethlehem empty. She has the gift of Ruth, one to accompany her, love her, and live with her. Ruth has faith, but she will need some valuable lessons and wisdom in the days ahead. Naomi's faith is a bit weak, but she possesses great wisdom, as we shall see. This story, brothers and sisters, is a powerful reminder that as God's people, we are never, ever empty. There are times, however, when we feel that way, of course, when we sense that somehow it's us against the world. But that is just the power of, of feeling, the power of sin, not the power of faith at work in us. Not only are we filled with the presence of God through the Holy Spirit, we're blessed to be part of a family of faith where we can share our gifts with one another and bear one another's burdens as well. 
That's the kind of life to which God's people are called to live. You see, our lives are not lived in a straight line, but more like the roads that we find in the mountains of our Northeast Georgia. Sometimes you have to go down in order to go up, and sometimes you have to go back in order to go forward. But regardless, if you follow the road, it will get you there. You just have to follow it. So family of faith, in these days ahead, let us continue to follow in the footsteps of Naomi and Ruth and see where God takes them. But also let us see where God takes us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, following the blessing this morning, let me invite you to stay tuned for some very important and exciting news. We have a special event coming next Sunday, September 27th. There will be plenty of information to follow to explain what is going to occur, but also to tell you how you need to be at work to make preparation to do this. We hope that as you're able, that you come and join us for this very, very special event. We realize that not everyone can come and we will continue to be bound together in the spirit. But the session has felt led to provide an opportunity for us to worship the Lord and experience fellowship within the limits that uh, we have upon us. And um, we hope that you can be a part of that. So, now, as we prepare to go, let us remember our congregational covenant. And with one voice, we say together, I go into the world with faith of Jesus to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love my neighbor as myself, and to do the good works of righteousness. And as we go, remember that God uses what you have to fill a need which you never could have filled, God uses where you are to take you where you never could have gone. God uses what you can do to accomplish what you never could have done. God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. And now, as we go forth from wherever we are, remember that we go forth under the providence of God, Yahweh, the God who is with us the God who has given us his Holy Spirit, who leads us out into the world to serve and to worship. And now, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and abide with you this day and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, Jefferson Presbyterian family. I told everybody last week we were in the planning process of a fellowship service. Well, we've got it planned. It is going to be at 6 o'clock 
September 27th on the church grounds. I'll be sending out an email to the whole congregation sometime this weekend. I'm in Kentucky right now, so I'll, I'll get it out to you as soon as I can with the details of how we're going to do the service. Look forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you. Y'all want to get in and say hello? Come on in and say hello. Uh, Woohoo! I'm going to say hello. Hello! <laughs> <laughs>